Hey everyone, welcome to another On This Day in Canadian Military History live stream. Uh, if you follow me on social media, particularly Twitter, you'll know I'm very, 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 very much excited for this one. I've um, been looking forward to this one ever since uh, I pretty much planned it. And then especially once I got into the book, uh, I was just saying to our guest tonight, I could not stop reading it, almost to my own detriment of doing work, but that's life. <laughs> I just couldn't stop reading it. So that's uh, I think that's going to set us up for uh, for a good talk tonight. So guest tonight is uh, Kelly Thompson. I'm sure a good number of you have already heard of her and her work because I'm a little bit behind in the trend, but I'm glad I get to talk to her regardless. The book came out uh, two years-ish now ago. Again, time, I forget how these things work with the pandemic, but uh, it's been a while. So I'm still glad and so excited she wanted to come on and talk. So I'm going to really look forward to this and then we'll just kind of have a free flowing talk. So I have questions. Uh, fire away, everybody. Hey, Kelly, how are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Like I said, I'm very excited to have you here and I get a chance to talk to, um, to, talk to you and everything. And an experience of mine, I don't often get to talk to the person who wrote the book that I was like last really super into so quickly. Oh, and I'm pretty excited you. for that. So, because this, like I said, I'm, I'm going to probably say it multiple more times tonight. A, the book was amazing. I couldn't stop reading it because your writing style, your way of storytelling, I just, I was hooked, I think, from page like, well, one <laughs> pretty much because I was going back through it again and it was just, it was amazing. So, as I always like to do, and like I said to you, um, ask how do we get here it's often to a historian who's worked on a topic that has nothing really to do with their personal life or tangentially connected or a topic they've new topic they've taken on this one's your life so i guess the best way to start is kind of maybe just explain for those who don't know kind of the, the backstory that led to the or however you want to do it because it's all part of the book so it's yeah hard to pick a starting point you know which is sort of where the book starts, actually. I um, And thanks for having me, by the way, today. I'm really excited to of be course. here. Um, and um, the fact that I'm like related to military history right now, my dad is having a slight joyous heart attack right now from... Oh, no. Yeah. So he's like, it's like I've made it. I'm, I'm here. Um, so I was 18 and I was in... Oh, 17, actually. And I was in high school and 9-11 happened. And I think right. that was a really big moment for a lot of us. And uh, so I was in my final year of university and I was actually in the year in Ontario where we still had grade 13. And oh, yeah. so I was skipping grade 12 uh, so that I could kind of come get it all done because I was worried about getting into university. And then 9-11 right. happened and it was my family's military history on three generations on both sides. And I just suddenly it just seemed like the thing to do. Not that I ever thought I would because I really liked art and lipstick. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was definitely a time where, when I think when I said I was going to join, people were like, hmm. Um, and yet it just seemed like the thing to do at the time. I also really wanted to pay for school. I, mm. I was really stressed. I was going to school for um, professional writing. So it's not like I was, you know, heading into a big money making sort of right. position. And well, I was I worried. About <laughs> yeah. So I did, um, I did eight years in the military. I was medically released after um, an injury that never quite healed. And um, so then I did a master's in creative writing, just finishing my PhD in it now. And uh, my husband's still in the military. So I got here by finally chasing my dream, I think, doing the thing I really loved, which was writing and taking these two parts of my life that I really enjoyed and making them into something uh, that brought me a lot of joy. Yeah, and I mean, and as someone who, as you are doing your uh, PhD and as your previous, you know, work education in uh, literary, I could, I pulled some themes <laughs> as we have both our yeah. different things to do. I just can't help myself. It just happens naturally at this point. But that is the one. And I think that resonates with me and to other people, I think, as well as kind of, you know, feeling this sort of pull sometimes people obviously in two different directions because mm -hmm. I feel like I, not in the same way as yours, but I had that same kind of feeling towards doing what I ended up doing. I was doing something I didn't want to do just because that's what I thought I had to do, but then I, I changed courses. So that part of your book just kept making me feel better, I guess is the best way to say it because other people do it too. Yes. Uh, it just yeah. made me feel so much better. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's the, that's the one part. And kind of one of the first questions I wanted to ask you is because you, you talk about this in the book, I think in the, in the epilogue, I think I can't remember uh, anywhere or in one of your interviews, you talk about how this was originally going to be nonfiction, sorry, fiction, it was going to be fiction. And then mm -hmm. you changed paths. 
was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about kind of why originally you were going to make it fiction and then change the direction. Yeah. So in my master's degree, our thesis was a book, uh, a, a book length piece of work. And uh, I was always really convinced when I wanted to be a writer, I think because I grew up in a military family, it was like, I've seen what people can do to other people. And I've seen the nonfiction of the world. And I don't right. want to sit in that. I didn't really think about the really beautiful effect that it could have. And so uh, when I was doing my master's, I kind of wanted to get far away from it. And then so I was doing a thesis. Um, um, a, a fiction thesis. And then I also took a novel writing course, which I thought okay. I could use the thesis and the novel writing at the same time. No, apparently I had to write a whole nother book. So I was like, ah! and so I thought, <laughs> oh, I'll write about women in the military, because this is the thing I felt like I knew. And so right. I'm okay. fictionalizing yep. an account of women overseas. And it was a world I didn't really know because I didn't mm. deploy because I was injured. And so I, I felt like in order to write about women in the military, I had to write write it really sexy in terms of women okay. being, you know, at, in battle and this kind of thing. Yep. And it wasn't working. And my agent kind of, you know, I, I had an agent and I was really lucky to have one. And she was saying, I'm just not really sure it's working. And so I, um, she said, maybe you just need to infuse your own experiences and do some nonfiction stuff. And at that point, all my publication credits had been nonfiction. And I thought, well, maybe this is sort of where I need to go. And I think we have this idea sometimes too, where, oh, my life isn't exciting. You know, I haven't done anything exciting. Like who really cares? Right. And it, but it's about touching on the humanity of those things. And so when I finally sat down and looked at some of those experiences, I thought, yeah, you know, maybe this is where the story is. Oh gosh, I spilled my glasses on. No wonder I feel a bit sick. I was like, eh, I'm not reading anything. So yeah, yeah. it's uh, yeah. the same. I always remember to take mine off because I can't see far away. So <laughs> yeah. anything close enough. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> we have a lot in common with our injury prone. Are, are we a pair? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're comparing, uh, sorry, Evan, we were comparing injuries uh, before we started. As you do. As we had a lot do. of similar ones, it seems, uh, from very yeah. different ways, but the same results, which is interesting. Uh, well, that, maybe that's a good jumping point to, to talk about that, because what I didn't want to do in, in this particular talk, because the, like I said, the book is so well written and, and, and I, you know, I'm hooked. Like I was just, what's next? What's next? What's next? You're just talking about how life is, you know, you don't think your own life is interesting. I was reading this. I'm like, what's, what's Kelly going to do next? You know, <laughs> like I need to know. Break so, something. Any, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that could be the subtitle, uh, the sub subtitle. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but but that's that seems to be the kind of a. I know it's a pretty, really important part of the story, right? It, it sets mm -hmm. the rest of the story in motion, right? Because and maybe we can start talking about your military experience. Maybe that's a good place. So like, you literally lay this all out. But I was just wondering if you can kind of give us some insight on what it was to like to write that part again, to experience it again yourself while writing it down. Cause I know those are two different things. Yeah. So, I mean the injury itself. So I, I had broken my leg and I was having a lot of like, I mean, I wasn't the fittest person. I mean, I was healthy. I showed up convinced like, Oh, I'm going to be fine. Um, mm. And then I was like, Oh no, people train here for things. <laughs> and I, and I like right. love running around and, you know, doing fitness classes and stuff like that. And I mean, this was 2004. And so, um, I ended up, I was, I was 18 and I was having a lot of really bad hip problems. And then my knee was really causing me a lot of problems and we're in the field and it's the middle of the week. And I'm like, guys, you know, my leg doesn't look quite right. And I pulled up my my combat pants and my, I think I said in the book, my knee looked like I swallowed a basketball, like it was just yeah. gigantic. And so finally it was like, okay, I got to go to the MIR. And they said, yeah, you know, you just, you have tendonitis and you just need, need some talent. They gave me Tylenol and they were like, keep going. And I was like, oh, I can't be just that. But then you get in this mentality. And I, I did find at the time they did it, especially to a lot of women where hmm. the guys would say to me, oh, you took it like a man. You're the only chick that made it. And it was like this right. badge of honor that I felt like I wanted to carry. Oh, yeah. You know, I made it. Um, hmm. And by doing that, I now have a permanent disability. I can't squat. Um, my current my husband, who I'm married to, carried me for three kilometers in basic training because my leg was broken and they didn't believe me. And so um, it ended up you know, years of surgeries and nerve burning procedures and steroid injections. I've actually had my own bone marrow sucked from my hip and injected into my leg for, 
uh, thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, and it's just a permanent thing now. It's one of those weird body things that happened. I broke my, my tibia right at my knee joint. Um, and now it's just sort of gone downhill from there. But when it came to writing about it, um, I think for a long time, not that I felt I deserved the injury, but I felt mm. that bravado sense of, oh, I was injured and therefore I value that. It felt like I had right. done something only because I had been broken. And yet I did okay. so many other things that were of so much more value when I think of that time in the forces um, that weren't just about taking it like a man, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that's the other big thing, yeah. right, is this self-conflict that you go through um yeah. and don't and you, and you talk about it, you don't really realize a good chunk of it until much later and, and i think that's that happens to a lot of people and so many mm -hmm. different things but yours especially and the things again here comes the theme thing again the theme of you you talking about that and trying to understand the experiences and again you were early 20s i i, I remember my early 20s the same i like there's things i'm just like why did you do that? That was so stupid. Like, why would you do that? And only in yeah. yours, like, it's it's just it's it just brought so much to home for me. Uh, so I just it was really 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 important. So uh, the basic training thing, I think, is is a good well, it's a good chunk of the book to begin with, and, yeah. and I think it's really really well written because the way you you talk about it yourself, right? It, it's so funny because and maybe this is my experience and others who study military history, but it's you talk about how basic training, your opinions of it were formed by Hollywood. And then that came up so much <laughs> in training in and of itself from, yeah. from, from the NCOs that were training you. I, I think that was an interesting thing I was not expecting in that sense, in that part of the book. I, th I thought that was really, really interesting. I definitely would find myself actually scrubbing a floor with a toothbrush <laughs> and being like, what? <laughs> what the hell have I entered? Like, it sure. was like being in Forrest Gump. It felt very strange. Yeah. Um, and yet... There were also parts that um, when finally faced with them, you know, they would do these things like they would kind of put us in this situation where we were destined to fail. Like, right. Which they know, do. <laughs> yeah. You know, run up these 12 flights of stairs, change into this uniform, look completely perfect and come back downstairs and be here in three and a half minutes. Yeah. We're never going to make it. And we know we're not going to make it, but right. there's this mentality to it that gets you a bit crazy. And mm -hmm. uh but it also really united us together at the same time. It's like, we're all in this together. We're in the suffering together. We're in the joys together. And that's the part that I really miss. I miss mm. that, that um, the, where there were brief moments of that camaraderie for me, which in general, I don't think I necessarily felt as someone who was really girly and, mm. um, and not the most physically fit person there that I felt um, when we did have those moments, you find you understood it finally. You understood how mm. people would go to war together and look after one another and the magic and beauty of that. And that was the part um, that I saw my dad really love. And it was the part I really wanted to take with me. Yeah. And I want to talk about your dad later, if, if that's okay, just because yes. there, there's lots of threads I wanted to pull out of that part of the story as well. That I think you did an amazing job again, but Thank are you. really important to talk about. So that's one thing I, I want to kind of keep on its own. But one thing that you didn't really again, this is going to be the historian hat I'm wearing right now, uh, <laughs> is you, you talk about your experience, right? Because you, you went through a program that I'm not sure a lot of people are aware of, that, that civilians can sign up and get university paid for, which you did mention, but you have to train mm -hmm. first, right? You don't just, they don't just sign you a check over. You got to, you got to earn, <laughs> you got to earn it. Yes. Yeah. Um, but one thing that, and I, and again, you, there's lots going on in the books. So I'm not blaming you. It's just something I've thought of is because you talk about how, well, you were in the RCAF, and they threw you and with the army and the navy and you're all doing one and the same. Like, I get that that's a leftover from, you know, the whole amalgamation, which is probably going to upset people already watching, but because a lot of people are still upset about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering if, like, how that felt to you as being in wanting to go into the Air Force, because you talk about this in the book, right? Your family had all been army um, for yeah. generations past. Your dad was in the, still in at the time, was in the army. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how that made you feel as someone who wanted to be an officer in the Air Force, having to wear, you know, do the ruck marches and and do all this crazy stuff that is not going to happen in any Air Force ever. My dad found it really delicious. And and like we we would go to our first Remembrance Day together and I'm wearing, you know, my wedge cap. And my dad said, oh, quick duck. And so I think something 
you know, horrible is happening and I'm in the car and I duck and he's like, oh, sorry, we were just, we were driving by some army friends. He, and he was joking when I that. But I think no one really understood why I wanted to be in the Air Force. And of course, when you look at it, looking at different places that I would maybe want to go or different right. opportunities, um, I just felt like the Air Force had a lot of really great locations that I thought would be interesting. Mm. But for the most part, when you're in logistics, you know, you're kind of going to be anywhere. Um, right. I just always with the army people and they love a good ruck march and yeah, um <laughs> my body didn't like a good ruck march in basic training and i had this weird thing too all through basic training where i would black out like snap your fingers and and we could so in basic training i had to wear a heart monitor right. i mean come on now no no one wants to wear a heart monitor in basic training and it turned out it was cutting off some weird <laughs> blood supply thing just like the way it fit me i don't know so um where am i going with this all this to say i think i quickly i didn't question things when i was in you know when i was in and i would okay. be sent yeah. to the army and sent to the army here it was like oh this is just you know how it goes and i didn't really think to to question it all that much um and i i think i I really learned to appreciate the little bits and pieces that I got everywhere. And because in logistics, mm. where you're working with all the different environments and you learn all different people's backgrounds, it ends right. up so interesting. And um, it only was once I got to my logistics training and I realized that the Navy officers had to train in every single logistics specialty. So oh. their training was quite long. Uh, whereas, you know, for the Air Force and Army, ours was not as long. We only had to train in one or two specialties. So, um, right. yeah. So at the time, I don't think I thought that much about it until I left. And I was like, how much less broken would this body be if I had right. <laughs> been with the Air Force? Because then my husband's um, an air traffic controller. And I was like, hmm. th this was where I belonged. At yeah. my dad. <laughs> I sound yeah. horrible. I think yeah. every military person hates me right now. I also yeah. really loved it. At this, There were parts I loved and there like anything, parts I hated. <laughs> so. Well, yeah, that happens, I think, with a lot of us. Uh, it's just, yeah, to me, I just that's something that, again, because my initials, we were, we were chatting about what I did before, all, you know, my dissertation and everything. And my, my specialty and my focus is well before unification and Cold War context and all of that stuff. So to me, I've done some work in it and it's part of the dissertation, but you learn in Canadian history generally and Canadian military history generally is, is the unification and all the anger all about that and all of this inner you know service rivalries that you hear about and then you're here doing this and like you said 2004 and it just seems to disappear <laughs> maybe because you're all new I, I don't know it just it was interesting to me part i just i i honestly don't know what to think i just thought it was a really interesting insight i thought it was really great in basic training where we were all surrounded with each other you know in in terms of before we start breaking up into our individual environments which for us when having joined the rotp program it was only, uh, you know, once we really were in this because we trained in the summers and then it would yeah. be like you'd drop back into your civilian university world and go, where, uh, where am I? And um, and so when we would get back together after when we started separating by environment, then it was like you started to see that great breakdown of all the different mm. kind of things that we were learning and how we would all work together. I found that very interesting. Yeah, it, it, it's it's an interesting part. I think, I, I, I don't know. I don't, again, I'm still not sure what to think about that. To me, I guess, as of now, I'm thinking about it's like a positive, right? Because what well, we have, uh, Douglas, who's a good supporter of the channel, just said that you have to learn the same sort of skills. And that's also what you, you talk yeah. about at certain points. It's just leader, especially becoming an officer. It's leadership skills. It's how you go about tasks, not necessarily how you complete you know, physically the task or what the orders you've given to the other people. It's, it's how you think about it, how you go about it. And I think that that's a part that me as a civilian, I often forget <laughs> because that just doesn't really have the same sort of parallels a lot of ways in, in, in civilian life, I think. So I think it's just, it, it was an interesting thing that I pulled out. Maybe it's because, yeah, again, you guys were new. You didn't really, you know, been put in those silos yet. So we you know, had no idea um, yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it comes later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and we just, we had a, a funny comment here from from Roger who was on the channel last night and his background in the, in the Navy saying his son joined the RCAF and he still loves him. <laughs> <laughs> That's what well, I'm used to. <laughs> in all fairness, my dad stole the poster from my my book launch and put it up in his very army garage. So I feel like, and it's got my big old face on it in my uniform. So I feel like I feel like I've worked him over. 
yeah, yeah. It, it takes time. It takes time. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's funny it takes it takes some time to con convert the other branches but just that to me again true. that's something that comes up it, to me it, it, it's so so interesting um so uh, another question and if it's too much i'm sorry uh, you can just tell me to shut up no uh, uh, but you 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 share a lot about yourself in this memoir, and, and mm -hmm. I saw I watched a real quick interview you did uh, while I was doing some prep, and you, you mentioned that you 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 put so much yourself into this, and I wanted to know how difficult was that because I I, I know how difficult it can be to share parts of your life, put yourself out there. I do it kind of semi regularly with the things I do, and it, it can be easy. It can be difficult. Sometimes it can be easy. So I just wonder, writing that down and then revisiting all of this how, was that difficult for you or not, or what was that like for you in, in writing the book? It's funny. I think the reason I didn't write this book as nonfiction in the first place was because I wasn't quite there yet, and mm. I needed a bit of time. You know, when I first left the military, I was also suffering with um, a really bad thyroid disease and I was having radiation on that. And mm. I was really ill when I first left. And I, I, for years, I was just trying to get past that. Mm. And then I did my master's degree. So I was kind of surrounded by all these kind of artsy types and thinking <laughs> my world could not have gone more. Yeah. And then, um, and now as someone who instructs, so I teach at, um, University of Kings here in Halifax. Mm -hmm. And uh, I teach creative nonfiction there. And when I think about when I'm struggling writing about something that's really personal or that's really happened to me, I always think, who needs this on the other side? So who's mm. the other person who's sitting and waiting for to see themselves reflected on the page? Or has this story been told yet? And we need more stories from these kinds of people? Or mm. who's going to just have a part of themselves soothed by uh, by reading this. And so I think that's how I would get through it, even when it was really hard, because there are some really difficult moments, um, you know, people hurting themselves and the suffering I saw my dad go through and, mm -hmm. and those kinds of things, those were legacies that you carry with you. And also feeling like a failure in a world in which the rest of my family had all really succeeded, mm -hmm. whereas I was the girly broken check I felt like half the time. And so it was, it was really hard, but I think I had the benefit of time where it's funny now my next book's coming out next year and I didn't have the benefit of time and I cry as I work yeah. <laughs> probably isn't health healthy, but also therapy keeps yeah. me going. Keeps <laughs> yeah. Me going. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's another theme I want to come back to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big one that I wanted to talk about, uh, but I want to do that. And give it its own special, uh, its own slot because it's so important. Something I I especially took from this book because of my own uh, personal experiences and, and personal family history as well. It's, it's something mm -hmm. I didn't want to discuss. But what was my next question? Sorry, you got me sidetracked with your good points. Sorry, uh, it's all good. I expected Rabbit this. To happen. <laughs> I expected this to happen to me. <laughs> you give good answers, and I just forget what I was doing. Um. What was it going to be? Oh, right. I remember what it is now. Kind of moving chronologically. You you get through the training, the, the basic officer training, the program. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, actually, no, this is good. Sorry, we got a good question here that just popped up. Uh, oh. I, I am interest, interested to know your answer. Uh, did you read accounts of other women in military service while writing the book or story? Yes, I read two, which were the only two that I could find at the time. Um, so one was Sandra Carence, Outstanding in the Field. Yep. And I actually got to interview her as well, um, because I was writing an article. And, um, and so we got to chatting back and forth. And we were giggling her and I because she was the example of everything you would want a, an officer in the forces to be. Right. Um, and, and I... <laughs> I was more on the other side of that <laughs> spectrum, I think. I was good at my job, and I was mm -hmm. a good leader, but I was not the super gung-ho A-type fitness type. And right. so, and her and I were both talking, and she said, you know, what she always felt was she had kind of left behind other women, and I felt the same way, because you mm -hmm. didn't want to be associated with weakness. Right. And, and I would have been the one that she would have been distancing herself from. <laughs> And, and, uh, and she said, I feel a lot of guilt about that. And mm -hmm. I really listened to that when I was working on my own book. But other than that, I only really got my hands on one other book called uh, Refuge in the Black Deck. And I only had that when my book was already going to print. And it was the only Canadian versions that were out at the time. 
And mm. so, uh, and now I think we've had Kate Armstrong's book as yep. well has come out um, and we're starting to see more of those stories. So I think uh, didn't have a lot of that material out there, unfortunately. Yeah, which is, yeah. It, it's good that this is happening because this is a, <laughs> an area that's lacking. I mean, generally that's what me and Roger and everyone who was watching last night were kind of chatting about is this, a, the story itself, because he was talking about the first women in the Royal Canadian Navy and that, like, the crazy story that that took and how long it took just to get women into the full-time service. Yeah. But also the history of it is almost non-existent and how that's such a disservice to everyone. It, 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 this isn't, I don't see these as, you know, the silo academic issues of whatever women's history, women's studies, whatever you want to call them. I don't see it that way. Uh, but anyway, so this is another area I'm glad to see development because like I said, this is one of the best military memoirs I've ever read. And I've read quite a few, and I've read some of the, you know, the, the classic ones. And this is a favorite of mine now for different reasons, right? Because the way, A, you're writing has got me hooked. I can't wait to read more stuff by you, you when I get more time, which I, is always uh, lacking for me. But uh, uh, but anyway, just that's what got me hooked. And the way you told the story, and also when the story takes place, and what, you, and during the era that you're writing about, A, is when I know better, because I was older. <laughs> I remember these events, some of these events you're talking about and all these things that are happening. And especially now with what I do for, you know, studying as closely as I do. But that is one thing that is is so interesting to me is because these other classics are these combat memoirs or things that happen after the fact. You don't get this sort of, I don't know how to say this, but I mean, again, because it's also, I think it's so new and you're like a trailblazer in this area. That's it. It's new. Yeah. yeah we've not yeah. seen a lot of it. And, and, you know, my book shopped around to a bunch of different publishers and no one wanted it. And then the Me Too movement happened and it mm. sold in multiple offers a couple months later. And it was like, you've all seen it already. The book's the same. You know? <laughs> it's, just like, it's just sometimes it's just a matter of the times and people maybe right. aren't like interested in that kind of thing yet. And then those ties are starting to change. And I think yeah. it's great to hear all different kinds of stories from different kinds of people. And, and that's, well, that's the next thing I wanted to ask you about. Again, this is another one of the difficult threads of the book is the experiences you have and mm -hmm. how you, and this is the part that you, you share that a lot of people just don't for all kinds of reasons, right? Because they're uncomfortable or they've been silenced literally sometimes uh, is the harassment you faced. And at certain points, like I said, I couldn't stop reading this book, but there's certain things that happen to you and things you describe to other people. I'm like, I want to stop because it's just, it's horrifying but I can't because that's a disservice to not learn and not to learn and then take this in. And again, I'm sure that was not easy to write about. And so I do thank you for sharing uh, these, you. these things and sharing your story generally. I should have said that at the beginning. Uh, thank you for that, but sharing these parts. And that's, I want to talk about that a little bit because you mentioned the Me Too movement and, and what's going on here with the book. One thing that I did find striking is you said you weren't really realizing what was happening, what was happening to you. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. I, I don't want to give away too much of the, the you know, I, I guess you can call them the episodes of the book that yeah. talk about these things because I, I want people to read your book um, to get it from you, not from me spouting it out on, you know, YouTube. <laughs> but it, it just talk about maybe what you mean when you said you weren't really sure what was happening until later or, yeah, what that felt like. It's funny. I, I often think because people would say to me, well, I think you went into the military naive. And it's funny. Hmm. I totally did. But I also went in very much the way I had been raised was you respect people in authority and you be polite. And mm -hmm. I was polite to my own uh, detriment. And so um, when, you know, offhanded comments from guys uh, who are a bunch of 18 year olds, I think I probably came to expect that. But when I was especially later on in my career getting um the, the one instance in particular that I'll bring up because it was the one that gutted me the most um, and was the most invasive, but we were at this retirement function and mm. uh, I, I was so desperate to feel a sense of belonging. And I was the youngest person at the unit by 15, 20 years, I think. So I already felt really lonely. And so a bunch of the NCMs were getting together afterwards and invited me and I was so excited. So I invited them over to my house, like, oh, they want me, they want to include me. And I was so pumped. Um, and then one guy got to drinking quite a bit. And then as they were leaving and he stood and groped my chest, it just flat out came out and grabbed my chest. And it went on for 30 seconds. And I stood, I, I literally stood there like an idiot. And I remember thinking, 
it wasn't even the fact that I'd been touched uh, so inappropriately at a work environment. Right. It was that, oh, no, they don't really think I belong mm. here or no, I'm not really included. It's about what my body looks like. If I ever got promoted, it was, oh, who are you sleeping with? Or, oh, who right. are you? Um, it was endless and pervasive and so impossibly disheartening. Um, and on top of that, to feel like at the time, oh, this is nothing compared to what everyone else is going through. And I was mm. a trained harassment advisor. Um, and right. It was mind blowing. And so, you know, to see women I was going on exercises with who's, um, you know, in two seats up on the plane is the guy who who tried to attack them a couple nights before right. and they reported it and nothing happened. It, it was mm -hmm. it was constantly a reminder that, oh, yeah, you know, what's important was at the time getting the job done and not feeling safe. And it, mm. was, it was it was exhausting and it makes me emotional just thinking about it because it was really you felt like my presence was predicated on what I had to offer in terms of something to look at or touch instead right. of uh, my value at work. And I was good at my job. So it was mm. hard. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I can only imagine. Uh, and don't worry. I'm OK to cry. <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> I've done it all over the place. They already yeah. admitted I was almost crying. I think it was literally page one of your book. I was starting to tear up already um, <laughs> because of just the way you told them when you were on the way uh, to Saint Jean and, and stopping yeah. there. That part uh, that kind of hit me, and that's just page one. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, but yeah, like that's obviously a big part of the book. And uh, thank you again. I'm going to keep thanking you. You're just going to have to deal with it. Um, but being bringing that to, to light in this way and, and to talking about it and, and committing it to, to paper and, and talking about this in a book that's promoted. It's just, I think that that's a huge step because yeah. I, I have some, a lot of my good supporters are not Canadian, right? So they, they might not be as enmeshed in our local news and our notional events and everything that's going on with the forces. I didn't really want to talk about that too, too much just because yeah. it's, it's, well, it's not even, uh, to be fully honest, it's not about making you or me or someone else uncomfortable. It's, I have a lot of strong opinions on that that I probably shouldn't have because I'm not, I've never been a member. Uh, but it's just, I did describe, I think I described it in, on YouTube as a broken military culture. I can't think of any other way of saying it. Because and I this think, is, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, sorry. I think the thing is to, I think people think because I told that story that it means I don't still love the military and what right. we stood for and what we did. And I can't be a veteran. I can't be a, a military spouse like I am now. I can't right. be the daughter and grandchildren of military people and not still at the end of the day, believe that every single person that signs up there is saying, I'm going to do something that's bigger than me for right. a purpose that's bigger than me. Right. Uh, and I did too. And so um, I think there's a lot of things that are broken, but I think it, it's, it's also beyond the military. And I mm. also worked with some amazing men and amazing women and people I would count on and call upon. And so highlighting those problems doesn't mean that at the same time, I don't still really love the organization for what it does. You can still love something that has hurt you in some ways. And in fact, since the book came out, mm. I've traveled all over Canada to talk to bases from one okay. side of Canada to the other about it. Right. And it's been a gift. Oh, that's good. Because that, yeah. that was going to be my next question on the, in this particular direction is, well, I was going to ask this in two ways. What is the, and you just kind of answered it, what's been the official response from the forces? It has been that kind of thing, like a positive Amazing experience in a way that really surprised me. Um, right. And it was hard because I was out, but my, and my husband and I had just been posted. So we were in North Bay and mm. of course his name's in it. So he had to call the base public affairs officer and say, okay, so you know, <laughs> books going out. And she asked to speak to me. I think I almost vomited. Like I was, I was in the back, you know, having a hot flash, having a panic attack. And the first thing she did was ask me to come speak for women's day. Mm. And since then, I've been to North Bay, I've been in Winnipeg, I've been in Comox, I've been in Thunder Bay, I've, hmm. um, I am now going to be here in, in Nova Scotia, uh, talking to all the reserves for all of the Maritimes. And it's because um, I understand the world too. I get right. that it's not this easy black and white scenario sometimes. And um, 
And yet, it's also, we have, unless we're talking about it, we're not moving towards change like anything. And so sometimes we have to sit and be a little bit uncomfortable. So the response has been beautiful. Certainly I've had some, especially former colleagues, um, one in particular who the night before the book came out called me and said, oh, nothing ever happened to you. You, you were fine with it at the time. Oh, and it was like, well, oh, you know, looking, we all know, the military should know that looking fine and being fine are two very different things. And yeah. so um, yeah. for the most part, it has been magic. Emails from people, um, I would say it's 10 to 1 positive emails. Okay. And, um, well, that makes it, me feel better. Oh, it's been in a way that really surprised me. It's been wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause the next part of that two parter, I guess was going to be, and this is more murky, right? I was gonna say, what was the unofficial response? What were the people who are may still be in the forces? You don't have to name any names. I'm not asking you to do any of that part. It's just, but I'm sure there was some, there has to be, cause there always is. I have had people um, email me to tell me I should be raped silent. <laughs> not one several and then in the same sentence say but there's no culture problem and it's like it's okay. um and and this one from someone who was still serving and so oh watch out if i find you know i i'm not i'm not in a position anymore where i'm comfortable to sit and let someone speak to me like that mm -hmm. and feel safe and so um but for the most part it's been, I think, the greatest gift about nonfiction that I often see in my work and in book tours and the lectures and stuff like that is the power of change that comes from sitting with someone else's story for an extended period of time mm -hmm. and yeah. the, the change in attitude that comes from it. And so I've been so lucky to connect with people all over um, all over who say, oh, this was me too. I was going through this too. Or I felt like an outsider. And um, and my dad actually even said to me at one point, you know, I think maybe I was part of the problem for a while. And it was like, oh, I, who are I, you? Yeah, I think I fell off my chair. But, and, and yet my dad's a wonderful man. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you're, um, so I think it's, oh, it's been wonderful. Yeah, it makes it makes my art heart get all excited <laughs> over here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the, the parts and the responses and the things you talk about uh, uh, that part of the book where I'm just like, this is, I'm pissed off. Like I am pissed like that. This is again, sorry. I'm just a bit lost for words because the whole apology and everything and, and the classic yeah. suits and it's just the things I've seen people say online openly. And I'm just, I don't have to tell you that, but it's just, I don't know what to say, honestly, because other than just like, this is inappropriate, but you know what I mean? Just to wait, maybe that like how to, to think and to, to, to collect my thoughts and not just be, you know, you know, pissed off and white hot rage kind of thing. It's, 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 it's difficult for me to, to focus and be like, this is not okay. You know? I think of this one guy, I was on my book tour and I was in Ottawa. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and I was at the chapters right by the Rideau Center. And um, I had the, you know, they had this big event, this big Q&A, and it was really great. And there were so many wonderful people there. Dr. Sarah Lockyer was there. That's where I met her. You told me, yeah. And, yeah, from your, uh, from your stream the other night. Yep. And this guy came up and um, you could smell military often from a mile away. There was a buzz pet. There was sure. very much lots of fitness. And then he saluted me and I almost died. And then he said... <laughs> He said, I'm buying this so I can learn how to be a better person to all the women that I work with. And, oh, he had to be maybe 21, 22. And I was like, oh, I just could die. Like this, that's yeah. the that's the moment that you take with you later when someone's writing the horrible, nasty stuff. And then I'll walk away and go, okay, but there's that guy out there right. who's buying this because he wants to learn and, and learn how to support the women that he works with. Oh, what a gift, you know? Yeah, like that is. That's, there's the brand. Yeah, that makes me feel better <laughs> to yeah. hear these things. because the one part that, well, the one part, cause I don't want to, again, I don't want to spoil it, but the one part I did want to read is, is, is the dedication where you talk about your sister and how she has passed and I'm sorry yeah. for your loss. Um, Thank that, again, you. Another one of those, 
stinging, but it hurts. There's just a read about that with loss. Um, but also, sorry, I'm gonna start tearing up. I gotta, gotta try and collect myself. Is we're a paragraph. Right? Right? Jeez. <laughs> You got, you got this effect on me. You make me cry. Uh, and well, you're not the only one. That happens more frequently than, than I think it does. But uh, anyway, you, you put in the dedication, and then I'm quoting is, and to the women who see themselves in these pages, change is coming. That is the one part I didn't want to read because that is, again, I didn't experience any of this. I'm not, I don't identify as a woman. I've never been in the forces. But to me, that was uh, something that, again, from the beginning, it struck me and, and how you we were going to write the book. And what I thought I knew was coming, there's parts I did not see coming, um, parts that are disturbing uh, for numerous reasons. Uh, and I'm not even talking about sexual harassment or anything like that. You, you talk about a cadet during your training who unfortunately took his own life, uh, which is yeah. my, uh, it's just, it, it's, it's, it's upsetting. Uh, anyway, I just, I wanted to talk about that real quick. What you think the change is and what you think the change needs to be. If well, we you're okay with answering that one, yeah. I mean, that's a too big of a one. But uh. it was a funny thing that I, you know, the book I would have written that sort of early 2019 because the book came out in August, right. and um, August 2019, and so change change is coming. That was like the thing, and you know every book tour I would go on and they'd have a little poster and they'd say, "Oh, write something," and you're like, you know, trying to come up with something witty right. and. And so that's what I would always say, change is coming. And I think I say that because, again, I think there's a lot of, especially sometimes if people are put off by the title, as though I think women shouldn't join. And of course, right. it's meant to be rather tongue in cheek, right? Um, or what you, what you talk about in the book where you thought. Yeah. Because yeah. I, like, I can't remember, was it talking about the British? Was it it was talking about a bit of a joke on the yeah. Uncle Sam wants you, and then it'll, you know, make it. Yeah, a, the whole say Uncle girls Sam, girl. Kitchener kind of vibe to yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. But I think when I started writing that down, the more I wrote it down, the more I believed it. Mm -hmm. And it was because I, I probably felt, you know, when, when I was writing this, especially in the years leading up to publishing that oh, I'm probably one of the few people who feels like this. And then I started talking with other women, other few female colleagues, because just like Sandra Perron and I were talking about, there was this feeling like you had to be this tough nut to crack, you know? Right. And, um, and so you didn't want to talk to other women about when things were really hard. Mm -hmm. And so when I finally started talking to them, I realized, no, no, this is a really common experience. So mm -hmm. it was funny when we had the big public apology that came from our government just a couple weeks ago. Yep. And it was one of the things that they kept saying, change is coming. And, and I was, I was watching that and I'd watch it and go, I said that because I, I do believe that it is coming because mm. we want better things. We want people join the military because they want to make other people safe and free. Mm. And yep. so we want the people who are in the forces to feel safe and free at the same time. And I think so I really believe in that. I believe in the people who sign up and I believe in the people who are staying and trying to make it better. It's the only way it does change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, and I think you're right. I mean, that's the, one of the things I struggle with, because I've been asked about this, right? Because people, who's got a PhD in military history? Of course, he knows everything, you know, about military. I'm like, uh, <laughs> you don't know how PhD works, do you? Uh, anyway, but no, I've been asked. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm for a sip of tea. <laughs> uh, sorry, I didn't mean to. Uh, Goodness, I'm crying. Yeah. And there's not, and there's choking. Yeah. <laughs> we got we got everything going on here. It's a roller coaster. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, we got tears, we got choking, we got you know, can't, you know, laughter, we got everything. It's like your book. <laughs> um, sorry, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, oh, yeah, about what it means. Like, I am, you know, my angrier moments, I'm like, just burn the thing down, start anew. Uh, but I'm like that also because I know as a historian of this stuff and studying the beginning of both world wars and things like Korea and some of the peacekeeping missions. I'm like, that doesn't work because that gets people killed yeah. in large numbers if that comes yeah. up again. And because it, it already has happened. So we can't say that that's not possible. So I'm like, okay, we got to balance this. But so much things that have gone wrong. So many people who think they've done no wrong, which mm -hmm. is the other thing that just pisses me off because I'm like, you're an adult, act like one. Um, but that's a whole other thing right, about me getting angry again but like that's the thing I've, i think i've been struggling with right is like yeah what does that change even look like but again i guess that's the best way and you have experience in this so you know what you're talking about 
is it's just the people have to be willing to change and, and to make have it to happen. Be open to it and we have yeah. to start taking advice from the people who have lived it yeah. um you know things like how long women have been calling for investigations to happen outside of their unit outside right. of their oh outside of the military you know little things like that mentorship programs um different kinds of supports instead of looking down on them like they're holding people's hands instead of looking at them what mm. if we appreciated what everyone brought to the table and valued it what could happen then magic you know we right. could yeah. yeah i mean i think that's that's a good way to put it and well that's another thing i want another thing that i, I wrote down while reading is and this is a big part of your book is the gender roles and not even in the forces just generally speaking and how such yeah. a disservice that does to I, everyone like because like that's a big thing about your book it's like i have all these i have this value i can bring they're almost i don't want to say literally but pretty they're they're rocky get out of me <laughs> I, yeah. have these, I have these skills and these these things about me that can very much benefit the forces, and they're trying to get me to stop doing it yeah. because of whatever reason that, that they've deemed important. And and to me, that's just one thing that struck me is this gender roles and how it hurts. It's not just necessarily women and men; it's everybody mm -hmm. being expected to be a certain way, and that just does disservice to everyone, and particularly in an organization like the forces. You know, it was often something I was often told was. Uh, I, the number of times I was told I needed to be more A type. Look, right. I'm good at my job. If I have to stand up for something, I'll stand up for it. If something makes me emotional, it's fine. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean I'm completely incapacitated. But I will say I knew every single name of every person who worked for me, their spouse's name, their children's names, how old their kids were. If they needed help getting their, their dog to the vet once, I did it because they needed mm -hmm. help and they were upset. I was, I was good at that. And my empathy was a superpower and now it keeps mm -hmm. serving me now that I'm a civilian and I'm writing about it because mm -hmm. that empathy lets me look at people, even the people who hurt me and look at them in a way and say, oh, but where were they coming from? And so I think there's, um, it's been a way that's kind of served me as it turns out. Yeah. And and I I working with like the injured and ill soldiers, which I started right. doing as well. So yeah. um, some people just wanted to come in and shut the door and have a cry and talk to someone who was wearing a uniform where they felt that I would get it. Mm -hmm. And while I couldn't get it because I hadn't lived it, I could sit and listen to them and mm -hmm. not judge them and make them feel safe to do that. Um, and I will carry that time with me forever as some of the most valuable experiences I ever had. Right. And, and, I, and I, that's, that's the amazing part. And again, I don't want to give away too much of that. That's the later part of the book, obviously, because that's when you're, 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 you're being basically phased out because of medical yeah. Yeah, uh, is at the point I, I can't remember the, the title where you get your, your when you finally they finally let you do the training. <laughs> yeah, love training. Mm -hmm. But then then they put you in an area that makes no sense. I'm like, here's another stupid mistake that they've made, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not surprised that they put her in somewhere that she has like is not going to bring any value. But uh, oh, where I was basically an assistant, like a an admin assistant type. Yeah, I was an. Uh, executive assistant yeah. i felt like i was a professional coat holder mm -hmm. um, talked about that in the book. yeah yeah but i and it was i was frustrated because when i finally got on my log training i was the top student on every course mm -hmm. i went on and i and it wasn't just because it was because i loved it because i really wanted to help people so i was right. you know looking at the resources and i i thought this is finally where i'm going to start making a difference you know mm -hmm. after um yeah and then lots of coat holding. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, but but it had its beautiful moments too. You know, I when I was working for the Olympics, um, mm, right. the Olympics, and it was in that role. And um, I remember my boss saying to me, we had a Make-A-Wish Foundation contact the military because there was uh, a child who wanted to be a soldier for the day. Mm. And this was the first operation where support was was being considered its own separate environment to army navy air okay let me tell you how hard it is to make the support sexy to a 10 year old <laughs> and the army's like we're gonna take you in a apc yeah. and then the navy is like zipping him around vancouver around the olympic flame in like their super high test boats the air force took him on a helicopter ride and i yeah. was like I'm gonna make support sexy, and so I, I brought, we brought um, 
the MPs to speed gun his his uh, him and his wheelchair, him and his brother having a race, and we oh. cammed him up, and we bought it, we got him a uniform, and we and it was the most amazing amazing day. But I remember my boss saying to me, "Yeah, I thought you'd like something, you know, kind of." kind of like that. That would be kind of something that would go up your alley. And, and I went, yeah, it really was. I had the best time. And he went, yeah, you know, it was kind of like something I didn't think anyone else here would want to do. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. And I guarantee there were people there who would have loved it, of course. Oh, yeah. But I think that idea that just because I was someone who was emotional and connected to that kind of thing, and I will take that day with me as one of the ultimate days I had in the military because it was giving back and looking after other people. And that's right. what it was all about at the end of the day. Yeah. And then, and that's great. And that, again, another thing that spoke to me, because a lot of people don't know this, but I, I did HR first. <laughs> I did, uh, I didn't do the PhD first. I did HR first for, uh, I did for school. All the cool I, kids do, Brad. That's all the cool <laughs> Well, I couldn't get a job in it, unfortunately. I was close, but, uh, not quite. And then I decided again, change paths. But uh, it's just that's another part that spoke to me again is this willingness to want to help. Like, I mean, it's just mm. it's such a thing that you would think is so simple, right? Just someone wants to help. Why is it bad? You know. But you talk about that again, and then the basic it starts from day one, literally almost. That that that, that is somehow weakness, which yeah. is insane. But and again, I don't want to give take your thunder from the book but again but that leads to another thing i did want to talk about that you is another theme of your book is ptsd and mm -hmm. not only how that affects the individual who's suffering from it but the generational impact mm -hmm. that has that is something we i know that academia is not talking about particularly military history and what that means like it's, it's almost non-existent. We talk about it a little bit and it's a lot of, oh, don't call it shell shock, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's not really talking about the actual, it is, it's getting there. It's, I think it's still a little bit lacking and some people disagree with me and that's fine, but I still think we could do it better. But why I think it's so interesting from your perspective is because you talk about it because you, you're living it. And, and the one thing that, that struck me, sorry, just a little bit of the story time here is you talk about going to the Canadian War Museum yeah. and your father wanting to go uh, and you not wanting to. Because, and this is something I've worked for them multiple times. I'm working for them right now. And I just always sing their praises because they do the, they do a great job. They're magic over there. Yeah. But yeah. things I don't think about is the personal impact that these things can have. Yeah. Because again, there's a part there that, that literally a part of a plane that's connected to your family's history and, and your father's PTSD. Yes. And, and that is just something that brought that to just like, it was like a light bulb moment being like, it's, it can be something so simple that we don't think about. And, and but it is so life altering because that's another part of your book that you talk about is, is your father getting the help he finally needs yeah. because he retires from the forces. And he seemingly, again, this is just my own opinion is he seems lost. Very. Because and you talk about that when you're graduating and, and sorry, when, and what that did to him. Again, it's another one of those emotional parts <laughs> because it's just, I can picture that in my head what that could look like. And it was just, it was a tough part to read from him because again, I think he's one of the, the, the great, because I just, I don't know, I just know you, I don't know him. Like it's just, he's one of the great figures of the book in that sense of what he, he's learning and what he's gone through and, and the whole PTSD thing is something really interesting to me was that that had to have been, again, I'm just assuming but that had to have been difficult to write about. Very. And you know, when it comes to writing nonfiction and the ethics around it as well, right. um, how much is my story and how much belongs to someone else? Mm -hmm. And um, there's certain people where I'm not close enough to them where it either, um, if I can't remember their name or that, that kind of thing, but this is my dad and my dad mm -hmm. and I are close. So um, I asked his permission in this case. Okay. Um, and I said, you know, I really want to write about some of this stuff. And, and I asked if he wanted to read it beforehand. And um, because my dad it has bad PTSD from um, his time in the Golan Heights and um, was part of a pretty big, um, you know, the, the buffalo that went down in the 70s. Over yeah. And so um, very traumatized by that experience. And I, I didn't want to get into that, but I did want to look at the, the way it trickled down, you know, mm -hmm. when my sister and I were kids, it was like, if my dad was sleeping and we needed to wake him up, we would take our socks off and ball them up and then throw them across the room. Cause you didn't want to touch him. Cause he would just reach out and punch whatever was around him. Right. Whereas he never would have touched us 
ever in a million years hurt us. In a, and so um, I really wanted to look at what that did to us because I was afraid to go mm -hmm. to war because I was afraid what it would do to me forever. Not just because I saw the legacy of it in my dad, in my grandpa and in his father, but because I knew my nature, which is to literally 15 years ago, I saw a raccoon on the side of the road that had been hit. And I still think about this raccoon because mm -hmm. he was like, not like, this is the kind of thing that's going to torment me. I knew I would be undone by the experience, but I still knew I would go. Right. Despite the fact I'd seen what it had done to my family. And so I didn't take joining the military lightly for that very reason. But I wrote in particular a pretty sensitive scene about my dad um, being in a mental hospital. Yeah. And I asked his permission and and he gave it to me. And then right before the book came out, he forgot that he gave oh. me the permission. And then we're sitting outside and and we're just sitting out enjoying the day. And I had just got the book in my hand, the first printed copy. And my dad goes, oh, I'm really glad I'm not in it. Instant sweats, instant sweats. And so I was like, mm, actually, you are. And I'm just going to pour us all a glass of wine before we <laughs> get into this. Um, and so I read it out loud to him. And when we had discussed me writing about it in the first place, he said it was important to him in particular um, because he wanted to be the leader that he left as. And I'll never forget mm -hmm. when he stepped down from leadership, he said to his troops, and this was when I had just joined the military, so I hadn't even been to basic training. And he said to all his troops, he was stepping down because he was really struggling with depression and the PTSD. And um, leaving a command post, I can't even imagine what that must have been like for him. And he said, I'm leaving because I cannot be the officer that I need to be to you, which is to not just have it be nine to five. I care about what happens to you when you leave work. I care about what happens to you, um, you know, just like me driving my troops dog to the vet, you know, because they were in a pinch. And so I think I always took that with me, that that was the kind of leader that I wanted to be where even if it was really hard for me, I would do the thing that was better for someone else. And so um, my dad said, you know, that'll be the kind of legacy I want to leave where I'm showing people this is what leadership is, is um, sometimes you have to step down and a thing that's hard for you and for someone else. So we thought maybe it would help other people was, I guess what mm -hmm. I'm saying. And I read it out to him and, and we had the, the most beautiful moment. And he said, Oh, you honored me with that. Right. There's no greater compliment I've ever no. had since was, uh, I did his experience justice. I think he thought that I showed all the sides of it, which was really important to him. And he still came out with the dignity that anyone who suffers with mental health is yep. owed deserves. And now mm -hmm. as someone who struggles with it myself, mm -hmm. um, now we talk about it. We make jokes about our meds, you know, <laughs> it helps us. It's like a further bonding element. Yeah. yeah. It seems to be, well, that's a, again, another theme, you, you the relationship, because you talk about the relationship with your father throughout, because that's literally how the book starts, yeah. but also the different, the progression of that and what that even means and different experiences. And, but it's, it's one thing that's to me, and again, why I'm so thankful you wrote this book and the way you did is it's very personal because he uses, he uses the nickname he used. I don't know if it's the real one, but that's, yes. in, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yes. That doesn't change, which he uses, it, he uses it. I think he called you Lieutenant at one point using the nickname. And I think that was just hilarious to me because he's, we can he's say it. Moo Moo everyone. Moo Moo. <laughs> And my dad would call my voicemail and I'd be like, you know, I'm all busy, busy. And then, yeah. and I put the voicemail on, hi, Captain Moo Moo. It's your dad. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> says professional, quite like it. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. That's awesome. I'm sorry. That's very embarrassing, but it's also hilarious. Oh, because, I'm here for it. Mm -hmm. that, that's great. Well, you're an artist now. You can get, you can do it. It's yeah. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, good rest of the mill. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so yeah, that part, I think again, your, your dad is another person in that book who stuck out. Uh, um, and it's great to hear that he's he was so on board with it, even though he temporarily forgot. Oh, Which and you cannot happened. go within a mile of him without him selling you my book. Okay. So, like, watch it. Do that to me. So that's good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, already, I'm already. I'm already in. I'm already in. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm, I'm part of the club, I guess now. Uh, but, uh, and there's, there's one thing I did want to ask and it, 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 hopefully it's not too invasive is you, because you mentioned this, that, that the people, sometimes you just couldn't remember their names because you, you talk a lot about people, but some of them, the names have been, the names have been changed. Yes. Uh, except for one person, but uh, I don't want to say that because I want to ask that next <laughs> because I want to kind of end on that. I want to end on a good note because it was something I really enjoyed about the book too. But some of the people, right. You change their names. We don't know who they are. Though some of those people are going to know who they are. Was there Positive, negative, what kind of, did you get a reaction from at all from some of these people? Not, I haven't heard from a single one. Oh. Um, I ha- I am friends with some people still that I did basic training with. And so they've read it and right. thought it was great. I don't even think they necessarily know if they're in it sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, so no, I haven't. Mm-hmm. I definitely thought I would hear from my one boss I had for several years. Mm-hmm. Didn't hear from her. Um, and I surprised. don't know her, but just from your description in the book, that is surprising. Yes. And the only other person that I did hear from was right before the book came out, the one who said, uh, oh, nothing ever happened to you. And he was in the book and and called and said, I heard you wrote some, some feminist thing. <laughs> I was like, I don't know if that's how I would classify it. But um, okay. And, so, and I think the thing I learned was, they were not the people who I still wanted in my life. And I still have tons mm. of military friends and they're, and, and they herald me and are proud of me, just like I'm proud of them as they continue to serve and do the things that they're doing. And so those are the people that you stick with are the ones who you recognize, see something in you that you see in them and respect and honor in all that way. So. Well, yeah. I, guess, I guess that's good. The, the, there has been no uh, personal other than that yeah. one individual. <laughs> I'm knocking on wood now. I yeah, me too. We got, some real, we got real wood right here, not some paper. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like my desk is made of some plywood crap. Uh, anyway, yeah, I just, because that, that struck me because, I mean, I, I wrote this, also wrote this down because my work, pretty much everyone's dead. <laughs> like, and some of like, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just true. Especially like some of the stuff I do. It's, just, it's old, right? So the, the, that generation's gone. The generation that preceded it is, or is gone. Like, that's not mm-hmm. something I often worry about. Like, I bash some historical figures all the time. Like, I did one today about Sam Hughes and the Ross rifle. Like, he's long gone. But, you know, what I mean, like, that just came to me because that's something I don't think about, right? Because I don't do the more journalistic, I don't even know what to call it, modern writing, you know, because I'm it's history. It's literally what that means. Yeah. But also your book is history because it's in the past. That's why you're on the channel. And that's the justification I'm going with. <laughs> if anyone has a problem we'll with it. We'll take it. I don't take care. It. If they have a problem <laughs> with it. I don't care. Um, but uh anyway, just that that was something that was really, really, really striking to me was that yeah, the names have changed because that's something I don't even think about, right? Because I'm like, that's not the historical way. Everything has to be right. But in your case, I think that is the only it was also um from a legal edit. That's so yeah, legal. Uh, I think the only people whose names I didn't change was just my husband and my parents. Right. And that was it. Everyone else I changed. Um, and the way they looked as well changed a lot of them also was something I was told to do. So right. um, I think every, every memoirist especially has different areas in which they're comfortable with that amount of flex. And mm. um, so I felt sticking to as true as possible was the thing that made me comfortable. So, yeah. yeah, that's good. Well, and then you just mentioned him again, the one other than your family members, uh, the one person you name um, is your husband. Uh, My Joe. Yeah, that was, Yeah. what's the word I'm trying to look for here? It was the, I don't even know how to say this, like the inspirational happy ending for the main character you expect in some sort of Disney movie or something. I know. I know. And yeah. It's, hey, it's real. I don't have to, again, I don't have to tell you this. this is, I'm telling everybody else more, but it's just, it's, it's this. And why, again, I so appreciate this book is the re, like the rawness that you're, you're giving us by giving and writing this town. Cause you talk about your, your about him, his real name. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I will admit I checked <laughs> to see if it was. Okay. I figured, yeah. <laughs> point, I, it wasn't like the story had not finished. But I'm like, I know where this is going. <laughs> I just want to double check. Because I think it's one of the few full names you give um, in the book. For obvious yes. And, and to yeah. me, it's just, uh, it's, it, to me, it's just, it, it's one of the better, better, feel good parts of the book, I guess, uh, you should, I should say. We needed uh, something. We well, needed something to feel good. I mean, yeah, there's still parts, again, some of those parts are going to stick with me forever. Um, 
that's how I that's how I am. These things that I read and really viscerally think about get stuck in my brain. Um, but th that part is again, it's uplifting. It's inspiring uh, the way you, you you did that part and th the character that he is in the book. Again, before I, I don't know him, I'm mean, talking to you, and it just it's so. It's just nice. <laughs> I don't know what other way to say it. It's just nice. And I think it's through him too. You know, he, because of our last names, when we would line up in ranks, we were right mm -hmm. behind one another. Right. And I made this this comment at the end of the book, and it was an offhand thing I had said aloud to him once. Like, I'm so used to following your back. I just always trust it's going to lead me where I need to go. And and I thought. Mm -hmm. And how it's been so true. And then I, and then at the same time, I didn't want to end the book like that because I didn't want it to be like, oh, yeah. the husband comes and saves everything. Right. You know? um, because he literally carried me when I broke my leg. Right. That's, that's a bond. But I did have to like, you know, borderline stalk him for a decade before I made him date me. Like, <laughs> you know, give me some time. Okay. Um, you, you said it, not me. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> But at the same time, he's a he's a man I look at in the military today, and he's very aware that he is um, of his position of privilege that comes with a lot of what he's experienced. And so, right. you know, he'll often say to me, "Oh, will you come into to work and and talk to my troops, or will you will you kind of can I share that video of that interview interview that you did, and and so that I can use a personal experience that'll help people connect to that story as we talk about gender in the military and stuff." And I look at him and I go, "I know it's not just because we're married, but you're one of the good ones, you know." Like I see, <laughs> I, I see him making that change, and um, it's another thing that instills my hope in the military and my pride in the military and what we do. And, yeah, like he oh, was. All these lovely comments. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Read, gosh. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, <laughs> people are singing your praises the whole time. Uh, I don't want to get you too distracted by them because I wanted to ask the questions while I got you on here. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> focused. I'm focused. That was my decision. Uh, no, it's. Uh, how do I say this again? You put me at a loss for words in a lot of ways. I'm thinking things and I don't know how to articulate them out loud. He was like this gi joe figure but in the best way possible he just picks you up literally and there's rucksack and it's just like yeah whatever <laughs> what's hilarious is like i'm not thin you know like I'm, i mean i'm not i'm not i'm tall i'm you know i'm five seven and i'm not a slim person i'm like healthy and joe is thin and yeah somehow carried his rucksack on his front, me on his back. And then we kind of dragged, dragged it yeah. back along. Like, um, because he was the only person who believed me when I was like, I'm pretty sure my leg is broken. Yeah. And, you know, you, you take stock in the person who believes you when your leg is broken. Well, yeah. And a little and like Harry, whatever up, it was, three kilometers. Or and we're like coming that. up 10 years married. And I still really like him as a person as much as I love him, which is, you know, <laughs> It's been 20 years now since we met. God. Yeah, that's, Maybe. that's been, Yeah, that's amazing. That, that's the, the one of the good takeaways from the book. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of bad. But that that is what I wanted to kind of talk about in that way is because again, he's used a real name. Again, that struck me, like I said, but just the, that who he was and how he reacted and and but that he's still trying to make the change. Like that is again, that's another one of the things in the book, right? This these things are happening and at certain mm -hmm. points no one's doing anything about it. Which is and again, it's sometimes I, I I know how difficult it can be to speak up and to do the right thing. And sometimes you don't even know what's going on, literally, you're so oblivious, or some people don't even think there's a problem. Mm -hmm. It's just it, it's he's one of those people I'm just like, that's that's a there's a good dude. Like I don't say that very often. Yeah. But he's he seems like a good dude. And I'm just I'm so glad. And I was like, this is gonna sound probably terrible, and but I'm like, I'm so glad it worked out for you both because I'm just like I, I need, I need, I need some, I need some good right now. <laughs> if it helps, whenever I do a book club, which I love to do. So if, if like a group's reading my book and they ask if I'll come chat with them, which I love, they don't give a hoot about talking to me. I don't think for the most part, they're always like, so can we talk? Is, are you still with Joe? And they, and then they want to see him. I'm not even, I don't even know if I've written a book. I don't even know if I'm, they just want to know if Joe's still around. I tell him I'm kind of like, getting him ready for his second wife. Like if he drops me like a hot potato, someone could read this book and be like, I'm going to go find that one. <laughs> It'll be worthwhile. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Well, I'm sure he wouldn't be thinking that, but uh, that's, that's it's just, 
it's just yeah you're talking about one point where you're at the, during the olympics right and you're just sitting with him and it's just that part i'm like i, I feel good <laughs> like i feel good after reading this and what i work on in a given day and i'm like i need that Brad. We yeah. made it. I, I was like, I needed a little bit of that. And that's just a, that was a good part. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think we, I don't think I missed any questions from anyone. We just had a comment saying that it, it sounds like your experience is different from, from Heather, uh, who said when she joined almost 39 years ago. I mean, I can only imagine. We talked about that in the book again as well. Like what some of the women who've been there for at that point, long time, mm -hmm. and what they may have had to go through. It, it's just Absolutely. difficult to even think of it, to fathom. And that explains quite a bit about certain individuals, which makes perfect sense to me. Very much. Because, yeah, you talk about that. We talked about starting about that, that whole, you know, you got to break that supposed stereotype of women and mm -hmm. what they're supposed to be and what they're supposed to look like in the forces, literally look like almost in certain places and cases yeah. and act and all that stuff. And it's just it's 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 just another one of those things that I'm glad is starting to change. And I'm I'm so glad that you again wrote this book and, and that you're being part of it because again, like probably, probably people have noticed and you've noticed that some of these things get me kind of worked up and get me kind of angry just because I, I've seen reading history what this stupid almost pig headedness can do and it gets people killed. And I'm literally yeah. on the battlefield it can get people killed. And I'm just not okay with that. So sorry, I won't end on the anger, but again, it's just I'm so glad that you agreed to come on. I didn't think you would, not because I don't, I didn't know you. Well, I just thought you were bigger than me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm we're Twitter buds. We've been like this for a long time now. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like I, I saw a national bestseller and I'm like, oh, she's not even going to talk to them. nothing me. Nobody knows who I am, you know. But yeah, I do nothing. I'm like sitting here. I mean, I'm desperate to talk to another human. So <laughs> um, it's like really spruced up my week. Yeah. Like, I was supposed to go to the archive again tomorrow and they shut me out. They closed. I'm like, well, there goes my interaction. Uh, right. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I don't no. know what's going on there. That was a little weird. Uh, anyway, that's a whole other day's problem. But Yes. That was really weird. I hope it has nothing to do with might be happening there tomorrow in Ottawa. Anyway, I don't want to talk about that. Yeah. But uh, anyway, yeah. So uh, lots of great comments. I don't think, let me just double check. Just a lot of good chat. Yeah, everyone's just saying hi and how much they enjoyed. So again, thank you for for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, and, and for those, oh yeah, it, yeah. I mean, when you said yes, I've been so excited, and especially when I finished the book, I was just like, yes, I'm so lucky that she's going to talk to me in person and, uh, as much as we can in the age of COVID and big country that is Canada. But uh, very, and very. And you said you have a lot of your subscribers are not in Canada. Whereabouts? We have got. Uh, well, I can see right here. U.S. Uh, well, the Brits are asleep, or they should be. There was a few here. I don't I think they may have dropped off because they may have fallen asleep. No doubt. <laughs> I'm yeah. hoping it's not the content. I'm telling myself. No, it's, it's because it's like one in the morning there. That's um, fair. That's fair. We'll from let Belgium, it uh, yeah, UK. I don't know. They're, they're crazy. I stay up late, but this is this is late. <laughs> oh, Belgium. Oh, I've been, and it was yeah. just. Yeah, they're still here. Yeah, we we got Philip who's oh. from Belgium. It was just. Know. It was, I, I actually, my husband was deployed and we got to meet up a couple times and um, we, we picked one and we toured a bunch of memorials and I have a, mm -hmm. a beautiful Belgium war story to end on, not war oh. story really, but like veterans meeting up story. And yeah. so um, I was eating fries as you do. As you do in Belgium. Yes. Yeah. And so um, we were sitting outside, we were in Ypres. And am I pronouncing it right? Ypres? I hope. Uh, well, Philip might yell at you, but. Okay. Uh, and so we were sitting there. <laughs> and my husband was getting um, some fries and I'm just waiting and we're by a fountain. And there was an older couple sitting next to us. And we had, um, my husband had a rondel on his, yeah. on his bag. And so um, they, they weren't, they didn't speak a lot of English, not that I'd expect them to. And, and so the man came over and said, um, Canadian and I and I nodded and military and I nodded and he started to cry and he took my hands and he said thank you and then we hugged me and this man I didn't know and his wife and we sat and we hugged in the middle of this fountain it was like it was it might have been the most special moment I had ever had and he didn't know uh that I was a veteran either I'm sure but then my husband right. came they were shaking hands it was so wonderful. You could have just, your heart would have exploded. Oh, oh just I bet. Not to mention what a beautiful country with the most lovely people. 
Oh yeah. No. I ate so much. Yeah, me too. And I was only in Belgium for a couple of days. <laughs> was, oh gosh, it was. I, call, just... I just call it. I call it eat because that's what it was during the First World War and Second, and that gets me in trouble with some people. But I'm old, and well, I'm not actually old. I feel old, but uh, sorry, and sorry, that's what I go with. But uh, no, it's an amazing city. Great people, nothing but a great, yes. great experience there. So I'm glad you yeah. you had the fame because I know a lot of people do. It was lovely. Yeah, I bet. Uh, yeah, so I think that's good to end with just getting more good comments. Um, oh, and, then, Rowan. and we've got uh, Angela who's in the States. Uh, Hi, Angela. She's a great supporter of historians, me as well, and all kinds of us. And it's great oh, to have American supporters, I will say that. And Scott is also in the US, which I think I said. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I think that's good. Uh, there's a link below for everyone who hasn't read the book uh, to buy it. it. It helps me out a little bit if you do, but just get it as many ways as you can, as I often say, for the really, really good ones. Uh, if it's in the library, just go get it there. It's amazing. Um, like and I, I said, love sending out signed book plates. Scott, did you get yours yet? We'll give them a I second. Think... We're delayed. We're, we're del I still want oh. mine. Yes. So I, I, I'm, if you literally send me an email, I love to mail signed book plates out to people. <laughs> Scott, I sent yours. If it's not there yet. I'm still waiting for mine. All right. It's in the I mail. Think, Definitely I think send Canada it Post is uh, playing with me here. Yeah. And Angela said she's going to get the book, which is amazing. Yay. Love when the can, when the can con, which you'll know you're Canadians, you know what that means. Go south of the border. I feel like you saying that sometimes to Americans and Brits and they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, that's uh, that that's great. Yeah, so I'm sure Angela, you'll be getting an email from Angela about the book place. Because um, uh, again, Angela is uh, uh, great. And Susan, who's saying great discussion. She's also in the US. So Let's thanks everyone that. for watching. So thanks again, Kelly. I'm just going to do a quick sign off and then I'll come say goodbye to you and then we'll sign off together, okay? Thank you. So thanks everyone for watching. I uh, really appreciate everyone coming out again, uh, ending up this week of uh, Women in the Canadian Armed Forces. Hope to do more themed weeks in the future. Uh, next week, I don't really have anything booked as of yet. Um, there's some things I might be doing. I'm not sure yet. This week was crazy for me and next week is as well. So um, I still got to get some details hammered out, but I'll be sure to get it out on all the social media stuff as soon as I can about what's coming next. Uh, again, if you like what you're seeing and new to the channel, please subscribe and like the video. It really, really helps so I can keep doing these and get it to see more, more and more people and tell all these great stories that are connected to Canadian military history. And again, if you really, really like what I'm doing and want to see it keep going into the future, check out the Patreon stuff. I've got 41 now, which is amazing. I didn't think I'd come anywhere close to that number. So it's amazing to have that much support. So I think everyone who has become a patron, check it out. You get lots of benefits. And like I said last night, there's more stuff coming. Part of the plan. I've got some big things I want to do for the patrons. So so check that out if, if you can. So thanks again, Kelly. Really appreciate it. Um, looking forward to what you got coming up soon. You said you got some stuff coming up. If you want to talk about that real quick, if that's yeah. okay. Yeah. My next book's another sad one, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Coming out um, in January next year. Um, also in the U.S., that one too. So I should be down oh, there for a little while. Um, so this one's about the death of my sister, who uh, I had a really complicated relationship with as an addict. But it ended up really beautiful and she died of cancer unfortunately right before my book came out my last book so um it talked mm -hmm. about abuse and domestic violence and addiction and a lot of really hard things but at the end of it about love and but i really wanted to thank you for having me and i really value what you do and historians you're really part of the change oh. that comes forward as we move on and uh thank you for what you do you've had so many great interviews this week and um mm -hmm. so thanks yeah. for having me what a great crew you have here yeah, a great, great community that's growing all the time and people yeah. are getting it. It's amazing. Well, thank you for saying so. I feel like I'm, I'm doing very little to help in terms of any sort of change, but I do what I can uh, because it's just the right thing to do and we're, we're all better for it. Like I already said, it just makes the world better. Um, if we can just more be, if everyone can be themselves and bring what they can bring, we'll all be better for it. So I think there's a happier note to end on. Everyone for just... Sure. Uh, yeah, we got lots of these are important topics, and I'm so glad that you cover them um, with your the way you write and your your way of humor. It's it's hard to line to walk. I know that for sure. So, so thanks again, everyone. Just uh, keeping uh, checking the social media because again, not sure what's coming, but uh, I'll see you next time. So everyone uh, have a good night or good morning, and Europeans yeah. go get some sleep. <laughs> Bye everyone. Bye.